liberal arts. Organized around an annual theme, this interdisciplinary series showcases the ways that the disciplines in the College of Liberal Arts shape important and meaningful conversations about our world, our cultures, and our imagination. The theme for this year is visualizing storytelling and imagining. And tonight, we feature Tony Baxter. Tony Baxter, for those, that you, those of you who don't know, started his career at Walt Disney Imagineering in 1970. He was the creative lead on multiple attractions that defined the image of Disney parks over a period of 40 years, including Star Tours, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Splash Mountain, Journey into Imagination, and the Indiana Jones Adventure. Without doubt, he is the best known of the second generation of Imagineers, those men and women who framed the Disney image in the decades after Walt and Roy passed. He is also a graduate of the CSU system, having spent part of his undergraduate years at Cal Poly Pomona. <laughs> and part of them at CSU Long Beach. All of the students in the audience know that Cal Poly requires a capstone senior project from all of its students before graduation. Tony's senior project was a ride concept related to the yet to be produced film, Island at the Top of the World. Collaboration is also an ideal that frames student work here at Cal Poly with students working from diverse disciplines on learn by doing projects. Collaboration is also one of the ideals that framework at Imagineering, where artists, writers, and designers work alongside engineers, architects, and programmers from the start of a project to its installation. At the time of his retirement, Tony held the top creative position at Walt Disney Imagineering and was senior vice president of creative development but I've been told that he prefers to be referred to as just an idea guy. Please welcome Tony Baxter. Now it's tired, I'm tired. I'm just scaling back a little bit, okay? So I can never retire. I'm remodeling my house and, you know, whatever. Um, it says, attributes because I don't want to stand up here and give you a formula for creating fabulous things because there are no formulas. As soon as you think you've got a formula, it's an old hat and it's not going to do you any good. So what I have discovered and what I'm going to take you through are seven things, seven types of people that it's really good to associate with uh, in building a project that you'll find will extend all the things that you can think about that you bring to the project and make it something, as you were just saying, Todd, better because it incorporates so many other viewpoints and, and capabilities. So to get on this journey, I'm going to do a pre-show. Anybody that's been to Disneyland knows what a pre-show is. While you're waiting in the line for the main portion of the show, we give you something to set your minds into gear. So I, this is my pre-show. I may be past retirement, but I feel like I'm still 12 years old. I fell in love with this movie big when I saw it. Um, it was a child who wished to be old, and Tom Hanks took over the role and became a 35-year-old, 12-year-old child designing toys in a toy factory. And he suddenly rose to the top, became senior vice president, and to the dismay of all his other, you know, uh, co-workers. They couldn't understand how this young person had moved to the top. Well, again, he was the ideal person. He was the, the receptor, the audience, for what it was they built, which was toys. And I, there were great sequences in it, this scene in particular, where Tom Hanks said, well, I don't get it. What's fun about a building that turns into a robot? And I said, how many times have I sat in a meeting where someone is talking about, if we only could get into the 12 to the 14-year-old range, we would extend the value and the life of this product by so much. And instead, he's sitting there going, but it, it's not any fun. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, is keeping that 12-year-old that's um, within all of us. We go through school, we go through a lot of training that tries to shut that up, tries to put it to sleep, but it's really important that you know where it is and you can find it when you need it. Um, for me, what do I, uh, this was my 12-year-old experience. 
at Disneyland, they opened what I thought were the most incredible rides and the most incredible things I'd ever seen. They built a Matterhorn. Right after Walt did a movie called Third Man on the Mountain, he goes, I think I'd like one of those at Disneyland. So I remember people that worked there that said, Walt must be crazy. He wants to build a 100 scale version of the Swiss Mountain in Disneyland, right next to the castle. And then I fell in love with this Herbie Ryman painting because it showed the boats going through higher water. And of course, my little 12 year old mind didn't realize that it was a waterfall and it wasn't deeper water that they'd somehow found a way to keep it at that level and pierce it to have the submarines go through it in, into deeper space. But when it opened, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Um, at the same time, in the theaters, Walt Disney brought to the screen Sleeping Beauty, which I read about five years ago in a summary of great moments in 70 millimeter and high quality film imagery. Uh, they said even to this day, the ending climax of that Disney film, with the fight of the Maleficent turned into a dragon, is probably one of the most stunning graphic images ever put on film. And I fully agree. It really changed my life. And as we go through this, you'll see how dragons come to life again and again. So um, I was going to Cal Poly, and I was a little bit of a maverick, you know. So whatever would happen, I would try to come up with an alternate thing. You're always seeing another way, a different way. And uh, when they put the jump, they put the uh, dinosaurs in the uh, train ride around the park. And I was really disturbed about that. I said, you're going from the future to Main Street. What are the dinosaurs doing there? <laughs> they should be lost somewhere in the jungle. So I painted this painting uh, while I was in school, and I showed it to a few people, not realizing I was probably offending five people that made the decision to put the dinosaurs on the train ride. But there they were. And uh, that sort of has defined my career as where they, they tolerate me, but they know I can be a bit of a maverick. Um, then I met a, a mentor at, at, uh, at Long Beach State, Dr. Maxine Merlino, and I stayed friends with her till her passing at 101. And by that time, she had written Soaring at Disneyland, at California Adventure, when she was 95, and she goes, she thanked me so much. She said, I didn't ever think at 95 I would hang glide, <laughs> you know? And I really feel like I know what that experience is. So she was just a wonderful, free spirit, and I don't think she ever past the age of 12 in my mind, but she let me do what you see in the background, which was an attraction for Disneyland based on an upcoming film uh, that wasn't out yet, so I thought I'm playing my cards right, I'm showing them I know what they're going to be doing in the future, and I've got a way to demonstrate that in an attraction. Instead of doing an opera, we were supposed to design Turandot, and I, frankly, that to my little 12-year-old brain, the idea of designing Turandot was not as exciting as designing Island at the Top of the World. So she let me do that, but she worked my tail end off. And I figured out all the things. It was primarily kind of a, a, a riff on the pirate ride, so I modified the pirate boat, and I figured out how you'd walk through a giant mushroom forest, and you board uh, these Viking vessels and head off to the top of the world, where, of course, at the end, now it was six years after seeing uh, Sleeping Beauty, I would have this giant fire-breathing dragon you know, for the finale. It worked in the movie, it's gonna work definitely in my ride. So that was what I was doing in school. But for fun, I was kind of a closet engineer. And I had this thing where I was working with marbles. I couldn't afford a very elaborate train set. So I figured a way to get marbles to run through all these maze-like things. And then using my design side of my brain, I made it look like kind of like the front of Small World, all done in all these wooden structures. And you could run it and play with it for about five minutes. And I took it up along with my artwork to the studio. They were sort of lazy fair about the art. And then they said, is that all you have? And I went, oh my god, that doesn't sound good. This isn't going to work. And uh, then I said, well, I do have something out in the back of the car. And I brought them out to see this marble game. And the guy goes, man, do you think you could drive that around into the back and bring it into the building and let everyone see it? And I said, do you think I can take it around to the back? Yes, I can bring it back. And so I spent two hours running this thing to everyone in the company. And that was pretty well how I, pretty much how I got hired from my job at Imagineering, building models. So I think it was the combination and having the nerve to bring a recruiter down into the parking lot to look at this thing in the back of my truck, you know, uh, and it worked, you know, it was something unusual. It made 
okay, you're getting an artist that's so-so, but you're getting someone who really understands engineering uh, with all the principles that you could see in this thing. So um, if you're ever at that point in your life where you're trying to figure out how do I stand out from everyone else, have something in your back pocket that you can add to what you're applying for. Okay, so I got hired and I was sent to Florida uh, by Claude Coates, who became my mentor again, my second big mentor. Uh, he goes all the way back to doing all the backgrounds. You, don't, you probably don't know the man, but every scene in Pinocchio, most all of them were painted by Claude Coates in the background, all those beautiful villages um, and so <coughs> forth. He worked on Snow White. His last uh, film that he did was Lady in the Tramp before moving over to Imagineering. And I always characterize Claude as someone you didn't work for, you worked with Claude. And that's a big important thing I found as I went into my main career is to always give people space where they could work with you rather than telling them what to do. Because if you do that, you start to encourage like, what do you want me to do next? What should I do after I've done that? Instead of getting people to start thinking about uh, their own contributions. So after uh, the submarines, we have this problem working in a real company where you spend all your money on a new project like Walt Disney World, where those submarines open, and then you have nothing to do, and you can't afford to hire any people or have them on staff until you've decided whether we made money by building this park in Florida. And so I got the idea, I'm going to sit in my room and start designing my own job so that I have something. So I did this sketch, which you probably all recognize, and uh, it went on to be of course, Big Thunder, and whoops, that should not have gone forward that fast, but, so I'm trying to go back and it won't allow me, probably. No, no, there we go, let's try it again. Okay, so they said, how about building a really nice model of that? Now, if you knew anything about me, I built models for fun, that's what I did at home when I was uh, had no money, and I just sit there and I built models, and so to be given everything you needed to do this incredible job, on Big Thunder, I didn't want to tell them that I would probably have done that for free, you know. And because I was an art student who had a lot of theater background from Maxine, from her class, I painted all the lighting and everything into this, so when you looked at it, it had a luminescence to it. Again, it was something more than you would have gotten if you'd gone to the model shop and gotten someone who wasn't skilled in those aspects. So I was beginning to say, you know, I see uh, people would, would come away from looking at it and say, have you seen what that guy did in the model stuff? That, that Big Thunder model is incredible, you know. So I began building, you know, a, a, a special kind of quality about hiring me on your project. So it, it worked very well to my advantage. So we built a bigger model. This was, um, and then they're asking me, well, what do you see if you go on this ride? So I hate drawing people, so I always have them facing away, you know, <laughs> see what I'm doing. So I started figuring out what you might see on the inside of this. And one thing led to another, and we built four of them, but my favorite one is in Paris. You're looking at a picture that's about 30 minutes from the Eiffel Tower, and what's unusual about that is everything there is green and lush, and there's willow trees and swans swimming in lakes. And to do something dry like this that reflects the American Southwest, for that culture is like giving you people a, a taste of Europe. You know, we all dream of going to Europe. Uh, they all look forward to going to the Southwest and seeing the American culture uh, of that period of the world. And so all of a sudden we realized of all the big thunders, this resonates more because it brings something totally unique to think a, a group of people, and a lot of them won't ever be able to have the opportunity to see that in real life. So, Turned out, Big Thunder became our number one attraction over there, and we have big, we have the Space Mountain and Pirates and all that. But number one is space, is uh, Big Thunder because I think it it resonates and it's aspirational on a level uh, that it wouldn't be if you were say building Big Thunder in Arizona, where you'd say, "Why did you do that?" You know. So uh, it was something we kind of learned in the process. So that's a little bit about my story, very briefly, and that gets us to the start of these seven. Uh, attributes that I'm going to talk about. And so we're going to begin with an obvious one, visionary thinking. Uh, and why I, I start with that is the visions fuel the future. So if you think of some of these minds that I've got up there, what they created didn't take it to the end run, but it set the stage so there were kids that dreamed about what they read that these people invented or talked about and went further with it. The whole space program 
which launched man into space from central Florida was written about in Jules Verne's literature 100 years before, where he said it would happen, and it would happen from central Florida. I'm sure some young person read that and said, well, why not launch it from central Florida? And it, it turned out that way. We're in kind of a quandary of time now uh, for uh, students growing up in this. You know, imagineering the future is way different than just when I started imagineering, I hate to say this, almost 50 years ago. Forget that I said that. Um, <laughs> But the difference is there are just, there's such limited time. You hear every one of us says this, no matter how young or old you are. And there's too many choices of things that we can do with our time. You don't have to watch. I had to watch the Beverly Hillbillies on Wednesday night because that was all that was on TV and there were no other choices. So we all just sat in the living room and watched that and the next day we'd talk about it at school. But today you have so many ways to find you know, things you're interested in that you don't have to put up with that. And when I was doing some research, uh, we were working with some, some students from Carnegie Mellon. And they have an odd department there. They merge their theater department with their computer technologies department. And so it brings together the arts and sciences into a group. And we were all sitting there talking. And I said, well, what do you guys think? Do you think we're going to need to put interactivity with you know, computer control in your phone so you can run the pirate ride from your seat in the boat? Um, or what? And they said, no, you know, we still do everything that you do. We go to movies, we do all the same stuff. We just don't have to put up with things that are kind of mediocre. We just don't do them anymore. And I suddenly thought, boy, is that an eye opener? You know, we sit in a meeting and you hear, we've just got to do it. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. We've just got to get it out there. We've got to get past this point. That is absolutely the worst thing that you could be doing in this day and age. You know, it's a recipe. If you want a formula, that's a formula for disaster, and there are a lot of good examples of that. Um, when I was a kid, there were two big companies that put out a book that was as thick as a, a telephone directory. You don't even know what a telephone directory is anymore. But it was this thick, and it had all these dreaming pages of toys and clothes and whatnot. Montgomery Wards and Sears Roebuck, and they thought they owned the world, and that we'd always stay that way. And this was the catalog that we got every year, and I would bend over the corner of the pages where the toys that I wanted were on and whatnot. So it had been in business from, from that point on, but they were not looking when all of a sudden this happened. Yeah. And you've got this whole new way of buying things, and you can compare pricing, and you can do a lot of things, and you can pick tomorrow, it'll arrive tomorrow if you want it. So all of a sudden, some, a model that had existed for 100 years was obsolete overnight. And for me, growing up as a teenager in the 60s and 70s, uh, Tower Records was where it was at. I mean, like, they were open till midnight every night. They were open on Christmas Day. You know, all of the, you could get money on Christmas and then go to Tower Records at 11.30 on Christmas Day and still buy stuff, you know. And who would think that they would be so out of touch that, again, something would come along and they weren't prepared to make that, that move. They had no skills for how to uh, absorb into the change in culture. Of course, the genius at this was um, Steve Jobs. I keep him in my show because there's no one else that's come close. And I think I'm on fair ground to say some of the products Apple has developed since Steve Jobs don't stand quite up to the level of things that happened there when he was with us. So, very important that you, know, you find these visionary thinkers in today's world. Um, for me and my little world, uh, back in 1995, April, Michael Eisner was running the Walt Disney Company. He said, oh my god, we're five years away from the change of the millennium. We've got to have an idea about what are we going to be five years from now. And so a memo went out asking all of us to write down what it was we thought would really position Disney uh, in the coming you know, millennium, how it would be. So I wrote this up, and it was pretty much on the exact moment of the turn of the century. We premiered the first feature-length, fully animated 3D IMAX style on a barcode projector, by the way, uh, and complete with binaural sound and so forth. Never heard a thing. Five years passed, four and a half years passed, and suddenly I read a little blurb in the paper. My boss does. And my boss says, come in here and, and look at this, and it said, Fantasia to be reshot uh, re and filmed for IMAX and will be opening on New Year's Day. And sure enough, it was. And I got that note back from Michael, you know, 
uh, saying thank you very much, and here's two tickets to go see the movie. <laughs> so, but it opened on January 1st, 2000, and that sort of set into motion a thing that just takes off. It's a good idea, so everybody uses it. And since that point in time, what it's provided is another uh, platform to tier film production through. So it begins in that format if it's a big spectacle film, and it runs all the way down to where you're streaming it or watching it on a cable channel at the end. So it gives the studios a very important higher end market where they can charge you 20 bucks to see it in IMAX. And it is a great experience. So those are the, that was an example of where I was able to do that. You don't always, if you're not uh, working for yourself and you're working for a company, it becomes part of your job to be doing those things and they keep you employed because you come up with things like that, but you don't often get the, the recognition, recognition that you'd like uh, for coming up with something like, like that, which you would if you were Steve Jobs or uh, one of the owners of one of these companies. My second one, I, if there's a new Maverick out there, please let me know. The only one I can find is, uh, you know, what's his name from the 50s and 60s? Uh, James, but Garner. James Garner, there you go, even too old for me. Uh, so. But, you know, this idea I mentioned to you about my thought on putting those dinosaurs in the jungle where I thought they'd be a lost world that you find at the end of the jungle ride and would seem to be more compatible, uh, that was sort of rocking the boat. And so there's always these mavericks out there that are tough to work with. You hate them in your office. They're disruptive and they, they when everything's moving smooth, they want to take it in the wrong direction. But for companies that tolerate maverick behavior, uh, there's a lot to be gained in that. So when you find you're working for uh, an organization that kind of looks like this, you know you're in trouble because if you come up with a new idea, it's going to fall flat on its face. So you've got to find management that is accepting of that kind of a, an attitude. So I look at this guy, very great statement there that Henry Ford made that when he was coming up with the idea for the car, the Model T, you know, if he'd have gone out and done a focus group, we hear that term, well, we better do a focus group. If you didn't have an automobile and you didn't know how they would perform and why you would need one, you, if you were asked that question of what can we give you transportation-wise, you would probably come up with a faster horse because that's what, you know, there was. So that would be your only reference to go by. And Walt Disney was of that same ilk. You know, he would make enough money off of an animated film to invest in some other thing. And it drove his bro brother crazy, Roy, you know, it would be like, we just got out of debt, and now what are you going to do? And it was to set us off on Disneyland, and later to set us off on doing the Florida Project and so forth, um, just at the time when they were just beginning to turn the leaf on profitability. But that was Walt, and he would put new technologies into the film. Back in 1940, when Fantasia opened in the early 40s, it was in stereophonic sound. And the war came up, and no theaters were going to invest in that. But there he was, saying people want to hear something open up and to uh, stronger breath and color and various other things. Cinemascope, that 70 millimeter Sleeping Beauty. Um, so this was part of the fabric of Walt Disney, being an innovator and a maverick. So what was it about this Disneyland? I mean, look at that on opening day. Everyone looks like they were going to church. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's hardly anything there. And yet, it was so filled with emotion that uh, a, a group that grew up on this, my age, uh, that saw it on television, saw it in the theaters, it was finally a chance to actually enter into a world like that. And, and of course, Walt was glad that he opened it. But within eight years, he realized, I have to have a way of putting shows on from 8 in the morning until midnight every day where we don't have breaks, we don't have lunches, we don't have anything, it just goes every 15 minutes. And so he developed the Audiomatronics uh, show technology with a tiki room uh, that sort of set that whole thing into motion. So you can ride the morning in the morning, ride the rides in the morning or late afternoon and they all look at the same level of performance because of that. But it was again a big gamble to spend that kind of money on something that was already working so well. And as I said, it goes way back. This is Valdemar Teitler, Bill Teitler, the animator. He had an extremely explosive uh, way of conducting himself in the office. In fact, he used every four-letter word, from what I've understood. And he even yelled at Walt Disney. And so the animators all got together, and they drew straws. And the short straw 
was going to go into Walt and tell him, we don't like the way that you allow Bill Tytla to talk and the way that he gets away with, you know, you know, telling you to get back in your place and whatnot. It's just not respectful. And Walt looked at my friend, Ken, and said, uh, Ken, where did those kind of creatures like Chernabog and the, pup, the evil puppeteer uh, Stromboli, do those exist in your mind, in my mind? Where do they come from? And then, you know, Ken just sort of backed away and goes, I saw where Walt was going, and he understood that if he wanted to put that kind of fear into a Disney movie, he needed someone who could resurrect those kind of creatures right out of his mind. So, uh, Walt tolerated that, and when people say, well, Disney films are generally on the sweet and kind side, I think there are some of the most frightening images ever put on film in Disney movies. Uh, more recently, uh, you know, the reimagining of Lion King by Julie Taymor is an astounding thing to take a, you know, a high-grossing film, Academy Awards, great music and all that, and say, I'm going to throw all that out and I'm going to restage the entire thing in a new way. I think both the risk that the company took in allowing her to do that and the risk that she took to mess with something that was near perfection in terms of you know, accounting for a big profit margin in 1985, uh, and putting it on Broadway and launching something that is still, I think now we're approaching the, the longest running and highest grossing you know, play that's ever been on Broadway. But again, it was taking the risk, allowing someone to stick their neck out and, and reinvent something the way that Julie did. Um, In-house, Ann Sweeney came in right, you know, I was telling you about the Beverly Hillbillies on Wednesday night and the three channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Um, that was where she came to the company. And all of a sudden, everybody had their televisions in their own room, they had their computers, they were downloading, they had YouTube, they had all this stuff. She had to find a way through that thicket and reconfigure a, the simple one ABC television show channel into a multitude of ways in which content is uh, absorbed in this culture. And she did a Herculean effort for that. You know, She's now moved on because she was so good at it. Everybody wants her, so she's out in the marketplace on her own. But you know, when you look at all those brands that came out of just the ABC network, it's pretty astonishing. OK, this one is a little controversial. It's funny how your shows change so quickly. I put this show together in September, and here we are, you know, six months later, and it's all together different. But I think you'll get the gist of it. Okay, this was Las Vegas in the 50s. It was all about terrible things. You went there to have a great time doing terrible things. You know, you could gamble, you could do things at night that are bad, you could do all kinds of stuff, you know? And that's what it looked like. It wasn't about going to a wonderful place. But there was a young man who grew up with Disneyland, that was his playground when he was a boy, who said, you know, all those kids who grew up with my era are going to want the same level of Disneyland, but they're going to want it in Las Vegas. So Steve Wynn reinvented that entire place. So I don't know what's going to come out of what we've all been reading lately, but the fact is he did do this. And uh, it's, it'll never be the same. The, 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 the casinos that didn't get on board with this are out of business. Once again, it's like all the things we saw with Montgomery Ward and so forth. So this guy was the maverick who said, I think I can get $300 room nights. And they laughed at him and said, people pay $13 to spend the night in Circus Circus, and that's what they want, you know. And I can put a show like O on in the Bellagio, and people will pay $100 for a ticket. And they do. And it's become kind of the gold standard for, by which everything there is, uh, you know, is measured. To put a water show out in front of that hotel that's absolutely free, uh, almost the equivalent of Disney's World of Color, you know, only it's World of Black and White in the case of uh, the Bellagio. But that, those are the kind of things. He gave people more than they ever dreamed, and people respond to that. And, you know, we have a lot of people that are right now brewing. I mean, where is this going to go? You know, I think it's pretty kooky that he sent his car up there with a mannequin riding it <laughs> through space. But, you know, one of these days that's going to click. And he's going to redefine the whole space program for us, probably, and how we drive cars and how we store electricity uh, instead of fossil fuels and so forth. All of that could come out of this. So we're looking at someone that's right on that border where they're still kind of kooky, but as soon as they switch over to transforming the world in some way, they become these, these genius-type mavericks that I've been showing. Internally, this one's kind of interesting. Joe Rohde, who's creative, 
and Michael Koglazer, who is our president of Disneyland, who's business management. They came up with the crazy idea, let's take our brand new, very popular Tower of Terror ride at Disneyland, throw all the theming out, and bring it back as a marvel, uh, you know, uh, in Gal what is it? Can you say it? Galaxy. Um, Guardians. 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 Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> Can I say it? Okay, so um, everybody thought this was absolutely crazy. Why are you doing this? The line is too long already. Everybody loves it. But what I think was at the back of it, if you've been to the Florida show, uh, Tower of Terror, it's fantastic. It's an A-plus attraction. And the one here was, it's sad sister, you know, not quite as good. <laughs> and uh, so by transforming it to Guardians of the Galaxy, it's become, it's one and only um, one of a kind. And uh, as a result, it's tremendously popular. It's a lot more fun, and there's nothing you have to compare it to. And I, I, I think all along I was pretty much on board with this one, but you would not have believed the negativity both internally to the company and externally about going and taking things like this and transforming it. But in the end, it's proved out to be very, very successful for us. And if you haven't written it, I guarantee you're going to like it. You get seven different pieces of music. You never know what you're going to get. And it's just a heck of a lot of fun. Going to go back to my favorite person now for our third example, putting someone in the driver's seat who's the visionary now that's there telling everyone, giving them momentum to move forward with this. I think it's the confidence that there's someone I'm working for that I trust, that all the effort I'm going to put into my work is going to pay off because we've got someone that's, a really, someone that's a really strong leader. Now, you can look at how well George Lucas did that with the Star Wars franchise. Uh, and then what I think is really amazing, I'm not going to concentrate on George because I'm going to take a look at um, Kathleen Kennedy, who's taken over the entire Lucasfilm library and brought an entirely new look at it, too. So if you look at what Daisy Ridley has done in the Star Wars films, taking over essentially Luke Skywalker and, and, or Han Solo, whichever you want to talk about it, but she's shifted it. So it fits far more with the world we're coming into where women want to see themselves in the lead roles. You know, having the main adventure happen to them. So from her perspective, I think she was ideally suited to make that thing and make it so the films are still accessible to 100% of the audience. They're still as entertaining, but there's been a dramatic shift in that. So these people that can do this, that orchestrate, and I think especially in the creative area, deal with this problem, that those like me dwell in this side over here, we're insane, and they need to be controlled. You know, So we gotta encourage them to continue their insanity, but at the same time, We've got to control them. And then on the other side, so you can make a profit, you've got to have a disciplined ability to evaluate it. So you might look at that as imagination, and you might look at that as engineering uh, in the real world. And that sort of comes together in the name of my rebrand of the company, which is uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. So imagination and engineering kind of come together in that word. So I think, in a way, Walt was setting us up to be imagineers because he knew you have to tolerate the, the lunacy of a Joe Rohde saying, what if we threw away the Tower of Terror and made it into the Guardians of the Galaxy? And then Michael Kogleiser has to go, whoa, how is, we just invested all this money 